Deadpool rips off Captain America's face, and for good measure, Deadpool gets nuked in this comic. So we are back <laughs> with Uncanny Avengers number five. And as always, for those of you guys who need to get caught up, you will find a link to the Fall of X playlist at the end of this. But what this does is this continues the fight that we saw at the, really the ending of the last video, which is Hydra Captain America facing off against Captain America and the Uncanny Avengers. Now, for those of you guys who are just joining us right now, probably for the first time, you're kind of like, okay, what in the world is going on here? Long story short, Marvel Comics had a character named Stevel, like literally S-T-E-V-I-L. Evil Steve. It was cool, but he was essentially the result of the Red Skull using a cosmic cube to rewrite Captain America's entire history, actually turning him into a Hydra agent. Ultimately, that story was undone, and the traditional Captain America that we've always known ended up coming back. That character of Stevel was killed off. He was brought back to life by Orcus, the government organization trying to kill the mutant population across the world. Because the goal here was to have him masquerade as the X-Men version of Captain America, known as Captain Krakoa, and then kill a whole bunch of humans. And when that happened, it would be a way for Orcus to blame it on the mutant population and further turn public opinion against mutants. And so it's a really cool little element to the thing. But this ultimately comes to a head with Stevel being unmasked, Captain America realizing who it is, and then the two of them fighting one another. Also, a lot of you guys were asking why Captain America has a metal arm. His arm was ripped off earlier in this story, and it was replaced with a metal one. So that's the answer to your question. In any event, because of the fact that this is Stevel, this is one of the things that I want to point out here. And for a lot of you guys who asked the question, how capable is Captain America really? Stevel is pretty capable because he is Captain America in every sense of the word, with the exception of how he thinks and the kind of campaigns he goes on. But in terms of battle strategy, fighting capability, all that kind of stuff, he's every ounce the Captain America, meaning he knows all the strengths and weaknesses of the superhero community. With Captain America subdued, the first person he takes out is Wade Wilson, Deadpool. Because so long as Deadpool is there to fight in any meaningful capacity, there's no way to overcome him. One, because that guy is crazier than this picture of Godzilla with an afro. And two, because Deadpool can always heal and always come back from the dead. And so the result of this is that with him out of the picture, it kind of leaves everybody there. You do have Psylocke and you have Monet St. Croix. They're both basically telepaths. They're relatively easy to deal with. The biggest issue he has to contend with is trying to fight what is in effect two ninjas at the same time. There's also Black Widow, but like really who cares? And so what ends up happening is that while Monet St. Croix is able to momentarily get the upper hand, he's able to incapacitate her with a headbutt and then in turn like smashes the ground, sends this girl flying through the ground, grabs his shield and then Captain America grabs Deadpool who was cut in half by Stevel's shield <laughs> and actually throws him at Stevel. And then in turn, he just like grabs him by the face and starts to pull his face off, which is kind of crazy. Now at that moment, you basically transition to Rogue. Now, for those of you guys who are asking, why are there X-Men and Avengers on this team? This is what's called the Unity Squad. This is not the first time that a team like this has appeared. Rogue is returning and Deadpool's returning, but the Unity Squad was actually a concept that was thought of after the events of Avengers versus X-Men. Because the two groups almost killed each other, Captain America had this idea of, as a way to kind of bridge the gap between the two, they would form a team where both groups would basically work together and they could always be sharing information with the other group. Not really as spies, but like being aware of what the others are doing. That was the idea of the Unity Squad, right? Quite literally creating unity between the Avengers and the X-Men. And so because of that, this team, even in its capacity, this has Rogue chiming into Captain America and saying, like, sorry to interrupt with like everything that's going on, but the nuke that Steve will planted at Empire State University is about to go off in less than a minute and it's booby trapped. And it seems like it's only got one off button attached to a retinal scanner. Now this is where the telepaths become important because that's where you have Steve who's like, I can stop it. And the response of Captain America is, then so can I, because you literally are exactly me down to the genetic level. But the telepaths kick in and they're like, nope, it's a trap. That they're, the, the entirety of the retinal scanner is built with an atomizer. And the instant you put your eye up to it, it's gonna disintegrate you, which is actually pretty ingenious to be honest with you guys. It's a pretty smart maneuver because telepaths just saved Captain America's life. So that's kind of cool. Of course, they ultimately end up incapacitating Stevel. Then they take to the rooftops. And that's when Captain America kind of sends out the message 
to basically everybody, right? He tells Rogue that that bomb cannot detonate here. He says, I'm sorry, I wish there were another way, but you have to move it out of New York, maybe up into space. But ultimately, Rogue's on the mission anyway. Now, steve does like kind of chime in for a second and just like talk some trash and just kind of make fun of them a little bit. And he even like sort of torments Deadpool and is like, did you ever tell Rogue how you felt? Because much like all of us growing up in the 1990s and watching X-Men, the animated series, <laughs> Deadpool's got a thing for Rogue. Don't lie. We all know it's true. So here's the thing. Once steve puts to sleep, Captain America kind of tells everybody, right? He's like, this is Steve Rogers. I have an Avenger down and need help at Area 51. There's going to be a nuclear detonation. And then Deadpool just kind of whisks away. And so once this bomb is taken to Area 51, Quicksilver is the one that whisks him away because Quicksilver is also a part of this team as well. But here's a cool thing. One, I don't think we've ever seen a Quicksilver Deadpool team up. And while this is isn't really necessarily enough for me to just kind of be like, I absolutely need to see this. If Marvel wrote a comic, I'd probably check out the first issue, to be honest with you guys. But the, the real important thing here is he basically tells Wade, as you know, Rogue has the ability to copy the powers of other people. He says, we'll have a fraction of a second to save Rogue's life by sharing your healing factor with her. I cannot outrun the bomb after it detonates. So I'm going to get you close and pin you down, but it will be up to you to hold on. And so when Rogue lands, the bomb almost immediately goes off and Rogue is completely incinerated by this thing. Now, I'm not 100% sure how I feel about this. And the reality here is it feels a little inconsistent in Rogue's storytelling. And the reason why is because Rogue as a character is ridiculously powerful. She's every bit as capable as like Captain Marvel Carol Danvers, because for the longest time, Rogue just like siphoned powers off of people. And in fact, in the old Avengers annual number 10, I think it was, it was a Chris Claremont story where Rogue infiltrated the Avengers and essentially took Thor's powers and in doing so, basically gave herself the ability to lift Thor's hammer. That was back in the day when Thor's ability to lift his hammer was part and parcel as just part of his power set. And like, that was it. But the thing about it is that I don't really see a reason why she wouldn't be able to withstand a nuclear strike. I mean, I don't know. This feels like more something of opinion than anything else. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. But the reality here is that Quicksilver whisked him in, Deadpool is basically thrown on top of Rogue, and then Quicksilver whisks himself back out. And this, of course, allows Deadpool to grab the hand of Rogue. And so as she's being incinerated, but not quite dead, she's able to absorb his healing factor and she's able to survive. Now for Deadpool, this is the thing. And a lot of you guys probably know this, but a lot of you guys probably don't know why. So Deadpool's healing factor being this crazy and this advanced was not always that way, right? The old Rob Liefeld comics, like, you know, what is it? New Mutants issue number 98, where Deadpool first showed up. He was just a guy with a healing factor like Wolverine, and that was it. It was not until, I think it was the Joe Kelly story, Funeral for a Freak, when Deadpool completely regrew an entire body from one hand, that that became like a normal part of his repertoire. That story is the reason why Deadpool's healing factor exists the way that it does. I just kind of felt like sharing that with everybody. But but with him basically saving Rogue, you get this kind of hilarious moment, right? Where it's like, you know, I've been meaning to ask, what do you see in Gambit anyway? And the response of Rogue is like, thank you, Wade, right? And he's like, you never have to thank me. And he's like, does Gambit make you thank him? <laughs> I mean, what Rogue sees in Gambit is that he's got very much a devil may care kind of attitude and he's persistent, man. The guy refuses to give up. And then ultimately he started betting Rogue. So I guess it all paid off. But with steve really defeated, not actually destroyed, but defeated, it's really been Yurik that saves the reputation of everybody. Because under normal circumstances with a story like this and really with any kind of an event like this, you really have a situation where things would kind of wind down and then nobody would really understand the intricacies of what was happening. Damage control would come in, they would clean up the mess, and then public sentiment would be people just believing what they want to believe. And that's really it. With Ben Urich as a reporter, while he's not really changing hearts and minds of everybody who is staunchly anti-mutant, he is able to get the accurate information out there. And the information is exactly what we already knew, right? That basically people were already aware of Steve 
Steve-O's existence and then Steve-O's ultimate demise. And he basically just said like, they brought him back to life, like Orcus did. And so it is a way to kind of point the finger in saying Orcus is doing some pretty shady stuff. But again, public sentiment doesn't really change here because people who are starsely anti-mutant are like, hey, look, do what you gotta do to win the fight. And that's it, right? They don't really care how Orcus wins so long as they win. And so what this does is it picks up with steve who is going to the courthouse. He is standing trial, but the guy's got a whole new outfit with like a whole white like suit and everything. It looks pretty dope. And he gives this amazing speech, right? One of the first things that happens here though, is one of the cops tells him, your secret empire perseveres, sir. So that means that there are people who are still loyal to him, Hydra and the ideologies that he created. But what he ends up becoming is a kind of William Stryker type character, although he does actually adopt a name for himself. So what he says is he says, I believe that every human being will stand shoulder to shoulder, that we can finally emerge from the shadow of fear cast over us by the mutants and their ilk. I'm not a cruel man. In my dream, the mutants are also side by side with their own kind, and they are at peace too. Of course, not telling people my dream is basically days of future past where all the mutants are dead. And he says, when someone tells you who they are, believe them. The mutants told us their truth. They are different. They have their own laws. They have an entire planet to themselves in basically Mars, i.e. the mutants called it Araco. And he says, man loves, mutant kills. And that's really where I say William Stryker, because that was the story that introduced William Stryker. For those of you guys who don't know who he is, he was a religious fundamentalist who believed it was his mission from God to kill mutants. There was a point where he blew up a packed school bus. It was kind of nuts. And he says, and what fear do the mutants have of death? It's a revolving door for them. We should not have to ask. So I'll only ask once, leave man in peace. And when the mutants ascended and threatened our world, poisoning our medicine, did the flag protect you, i.e. did Captain America protect you? Unfortunately, no. He fought for this flag. He says, I fought for this flag. Hell, I died for this flag. But like my misguided counterpart, like Captain America, I've returned and I'm changed. I know it's not this flag's fault. We let the stars and stripes down. This flag was once the symbol of a nation of men, and it is the government that let down mankind. And so from now on, I shall be a flag smasher. So basically, steve becomes a new flag smasher, right? Who really cares? Somebody throws like a cup at his face. It's one of these things where like him becoming flag smasher is Marvel just kind of being like, so this guy might return for another story. Like, I don't know. Maybe it'll be cool in the Captain America comics. Who knows? You'll probably never see him again. But the thing about this is that it is just kind of the uncanny Avengers team just kind of being like, okay, cool. So not everybody's buying into his jargon. That's cool. People who were staunchly anti-mutant are still anti-mutant. People who are staunchly in support of mutants are still in support of mutants. And that's really it. So the uncanny Avengers celebrate all their actions. Black Widow's there. And I don't even know why, because she actually didn't really do anything. And yeah, that's the ending of Uncanny Avengers. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. If you guys need to get caught up on the entirety of Fall of X, as always, make sure you click this link to the playlist, and I will catch you all later. Peace.